This is your host, Britton Ambrose. Today's episode is titled, Prison Reform. Ban private prisons. The current justice system fails black Americans, even those who survive police encounters. This article has been written by Dan Considine. The written version of this article can also be found on hollywoodinsider.com. Over 150 years ago, the American Civil War ended, sparking a 150-plus year movement where black Americans have been more or less on their own in their fight for freedom. The century and a half period has seen the constant demonization of black people in America who have gone from slaves to sharecroppers to subjectively illiterate non-grandfathered voters to women stealers to Jim Crows to enemies of the police to criminals and druggies. A drug so pure and so strong might just as well be called crack of doom. Of course, none of the disenfranchisement has left society and after the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, the United States has engaged in its most innovative and regressive lawmaking in history to silence black voices. Today, slavery and indentured servitude continues and it lives de jour due to the language in the 13th amendment the one that freed slaves. Section 1 of the amendment is short, stating, Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Fifty years ago, those who sought to continue black American disenfranchisement began to realize that the criminality of black men was especially powerful even after Jim Crow laws and even after the civil rights era. Racism remains in the collective unconscious of white America. Knock the crap out of him, would you? Seriously. Get him out of here. If you can't criminalize black civil liberties, you can criminalize black people's activities. And further, you can demonize them. Black men face sky-high incarceration rates in the U.S., and prison populations show us how we need prison reform now. Tough on crime is a mythical platform, playing on public fear. The society we live in is one fixated on crime for racist reasons. We prefer candidates who are tough on crime, or as I would rather call it, pro-crime. But let us also recognize that some of our courts in their decisions have gone too far in weakening the peace forces as against the criminal forces in this country. These candidates are big on putting more people in prison. Politicians who thrive on crime get a two-for-one special. For one, when more criminals are put behind bars, their base is happier and feels safer. You want to go back to the days of military weakness, caring more about criminals than victims? We can't risk that. I'd like your vote on Tuesday. For another, privatized prisons who invest in the politicians' future grow happier and more generous when their populations increase. This leads us to conclude that politicians like this thrive on more criminal activity and more arrests, though logically, crime should decrease over time due to actions that are supposed to be tough on crime. They've sent a strong signal to criminals by supporting the death penalty. Over the last 50 years, the prison population has grown 700%. The growth was nearly exponential until 1992 and again until sometime in the mid-2000s. This is enough evidence to establish motive as politicians have far more to gain from creating a criminal than from preventing one to become a criminal. So when I say pro-crime, I mean that those politicians firmly believe that the justice system is meant to create criminals for their political ambition. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. Furthermore, in practice, the disproportionate criminalization of black men is unruly. Of those born today, estimates show that in the U.S., one in three black children assigned male at birth will go to jail in the lifetime. This can be compared to one in 17 white children assigned male at birth. For further comparison, in 2016, the ratio of white American millionaire households to white American non-millionaire households was 1-7. For black American households, the ratio is 1-50. In cities, law enforcement is encouraged to target black people. 
the racial divide is enormous, and many of the laws and policies in our justice system allow the divide and mass incarceration to continue. Cities like Austin, Los Angeles, Detroit, and Philadelphia use a version of statistical analysis to put pressure on law enforcement to catch criminals. CompStat is a program designed in New York City to tackle crime in a more organized way than haphazard cop placement. Approaching crime statistically makes sense, and it even cuts down on crime numbers. However, politicians like Rudy Giuliani he amassed a record of 4,152 convictions with just 25 reversals. And Mike Bloomberg have taken ideas behind cutting crime and turned them into racist policies like stop and frisk to increase police activity. That the nation's largest police force singled out blacks and Hispanics in a tactic that's called stop, question and frisk. And there is just no question that stop, question, frisk has saved countless lives. All the while, they are forcing crime rates to stay low by downplaying more serious crimes like sexual assault of prostitutes to theft of service. Through CompStat, law enforcement officers are pressured each week to issue a certain number of summons or tickets for specific petty crimes. The system directs these officers to areas where perceived criminals show up more otherwise known as black communities and criminals are created by handing out summons for crimes they didn't commit. He don't even know my name and tell him I have a warrant. What, what did he do? That's what when they ignore the summons, a warrant is issued for the arrest. This means that when residents of black communities inevitably get processed for a summons again, they will be arrested and sent to jail for a crime they never committed. These summons are handed out for simple acts like playing loud music, public drinking, jumping subway turnstiles or blocking traffic. Of course, a summons is more of an accusation. The purpose of issuing summons is to intercept those with a warrant out for their arrest. The system's flaws seem pretty clear. It's a vicious circle. Affluent people can simply pay or use contacts to avoid dealing with the summons. But those who can't afford to pay for crimes they didn't do can either ignore it or show up in court for the most predictable court proceeding ever. Comstat criminalizes black communities and allows racial profiling to persist in city police departments. Prisons must be populous to be profitable relying on no-cost labor. Pressure to create criminals also comes from spaces in all communities, not just city areas. Private prisons benefit from huge prison populations by building an economy around prisoners, with low or no-wage prison labor as an engine. Companies like GEO Group Incorporated, America's second-largest for-profit prison operator, have secured a place in our justice system and frequently collaborate with all the bad guy names like ICE, ALEC, and Marco Rubio. Even in areas with sparse populations, private prisons make an impact on black Americans. In 2009, black men living in Guadalupe County, New Mexico, were outnumbered severely by incarcerated black men in the Guadalupe County Correctional Facility. At the time, the county's population was around 4,200. The prison population in its only 600 prisoner capacity correctional facility was 1,072 prisoners, according to the Vera Institute of Justice. The New Mexico prison is a for-profit facility run by GEO Group, and it seems to be advertised like some sort of eco-friendly retirement home. These prisons are no joke, seeing as the GEO Group has come under fire for the inhumane treatment of its inmates and workers. GEO Group, like its prison friends, is mysterious about its inner workings. The insight we have about private prisons comes from the many lawsuits and reports from those who suffered from within. We are proud of the services we provide to our clients, for professionals who want to make a difference, and at the end of the day, feel good about their accomplishments. Pay per day for prison labor at some GEO facilities amounts to $1 for the whole day. We know that U.S. and international corporations use prison labor for cheap manufacturing, though we aren't totally sure which ones are using them currently. I cannot say for certain which evil corporations are currently using private prison slave labor, as the things that happen in a private correctional facility happen behind closed doors. All we have is the information released by the SEC and the information released to stockholders. GEO Group's single greatest generator of revenue was the United States federal government. Not only are we allowing slave labor by law, not only is that labor disproportionately worked by black Americans, but the American taxpayer provides 53% of the company's revenue. GEO also provides language in its risk factors that dehumanizes prisoners. When the report states, 
a decrease in occupancy levels could cause a decrease in revenues and profitability. It means a decrease in slave labor poses a threat to our business model. The prisons also deal with a vast number of vendors who provide food, linens, hygiene, products, and everything else to meet the basic needs of survival for a prisoner. Though information in this regard is hard to come by, the following companies and groups are suspected of implementing prison labor for production based on accusations made against them. Whole Foods. Seriously? Whole Foods? Victoria's Secret. J.C. Penney. Coach. K-O-C-H. Coach. Starbucks, Boeing, AT&T, Bloomberg Campaign, Walmart, and McDonald's. There are likely hundreds of other recognizable corporations using prison labor. The politicians who accept payment and support from private prisons need to be removed ASAP. The way these private prisons operate seems illegal, but they've been lining the pockets of politicians who push their scheme. In the 2000s, a judge imposed harsh punishments on kids and sent them to for profit prisons for profit. In a scandal known as Kids for Cash, $2.6 million in return for sentencing kids to juvenile detention. GEO Group Political Action Committee alone has donated over $350,000 in contributions to PACs which financially support the following candidates on ballots in November. Write these names down Senator Marco Rubio, Republican Florida, Senator Mitch McConnell, Republican Kentucky, Senator Cory Gardner, Republican Colorado, Representative Steve Scalise, Republican Louisiana, Senator David Perdue, Republican Georgia, Representative Kevin McCarthy, Republican California, Representative Dan Crenshaw, Republican Texas, Senator Richard Shelby, Republican Alabama, Representative Dan Bishop, Republican North Carolina, Representative Jim Jordan, Republican Ohio, Representative Henry Cuella, Democrat Texas, Senator John Cornyn, Republican Texas, Senator Jerry Morgan, Republican Kansas, Representative Doug Collins, Republican Georgia, Senator Shelley Capito, Republican West Virginia, Representative Robert Otterholt, Republican Alabama, Representative Buddy Carter, Republican Georgia, Senator Tom Colton, Republican Arkansas, and of course, President Donald Trump. Republican President Donald Trump. These politicians think it acceptable to accept money from slave labor in order to perpetuate slave labor. Sending people to jail for profit is exactly what these politicians are doing. They are pro-crime. Crime has been a hot political issue used too often to divide us because the more crime is committed, the more workers, employees, they will have. We need to understand that the prison industrial complex as a whole should be illegal. Private prisons need to be illegal. For-profit prisons need to be banned. The United States justice system still denies rights to black people disproportionately through crime legislation. Black men become further disenfranchised as prisoners. In many states, they lose the right to vote if they are in prison for felony. Things that could constitute a felony in the United States, possession of a Schedule I drug like marijuana or LSD, fleeing the scene of an accident and disturbing the peace. Apart from the loss of the right to vote, any arrest record could lead to disenfranchisement. Those with an arrest record face a wide range of limiting issues like inability to appeal to employers, loss of driver's licenses, inability to travel abroad, and increased insurance rates. Black people often have to stay in jail awaiting trial when bail is unaffordable for petty crimes. Beyond the already disproportionate incarceration of black men, we see further disparity in pretrial incarceration. The United States has the largest prison population in the world, as well as the highest rate of incarceration. What we are left with is this mangled system created by corporations and lawmakers to perpetuate criminality. Despite promises of prison labor to decrease recidivism, private prisons seem to have no effect on prisoner recidivism. The pro-crime nature of private prisons puts pressure on most released inmates as they will inevitably be targeted by law enforcement again. 
While black Americans take more than their fair share of incarceration, the only statistically significant factor in committing crime is gender. Men as a whole commit far more crimes than women do. And that leaves black men in a uniquely vulnerable position with law enforcement. More money is funneled into law enforcement and prisons when pro-crime consumes public opinion. We need to challenge pro-crime beliefs, dismantle our justice system and rework it to fit a diverse and kinder America. We will never truly have moved on from Jim Crow laws, Plessy versus Ferguson, literacy tests, poll taxes, the three-fifths clause or slavery until we abolish the prison industrial complex, until we abolish for-profit prisons, until we abolish private prisons. Thank you.